Hello, I'm Heather Endershot, Director of Graduate Studies for Comparative Media Studies. Um, Today, our speaker for our colloquium series is Jens Polman, who is a research associate at the Center for Media, Communication, and Information Research at the University of Bremen. He received his PhD from Stanford University in 2017, and his research centers on internet policy discourse in both Germany and the United States. And his first book, The Creation of an Avant-Garde Brand, Heiner Mueller's Self-Presentation in the German Public Sphere will be published this fall. Congratulations, that's great. Um, <laughs> the title of his talk today is Platform Regulation and the Digital Public Sphere, Comparing the Discourse in Germany and the United States. Take it away, Jens. All right, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm very excited uh, about having the opportunity to present uh, my work here today. Uh, so to, uh, to let you know, I am a visiting scholar here at MIT actually since, uh, since October, I think. So I've been here for six months uh, or so, and I enjoyed it very much. Um, Kurt Fendt is, is hosting me, and I had the pleasure of you know, taking some classes with him. So I met with, uh, with undergrads from MIT. Uh, also together with him and two Europe's, we're working on this research project that I that I will uh, present here today. So I'm very uh, thankful for that um, as well. And I can say that I've been working with the, with the libraries very much. So AJ Tornader uh, has been helping me and us, so the team to, to deal with uh, access to data resources and all this has been uh, you know, tremendously helpful and um, exciting for me. So a big thanks to, to MIT and to all of you. And uh, the only thing that didn't work out so well, uh, actually because of the pandemic, was meeting people and reaching out to, to you, you guys. So when I came, it was still kind of you know, difficult. And now I see it's getting better, but now I'm, I'm leaving already next week. So that's the only thing that, that didn't work out, uh, I guess, as, as planned. But today may be a, a chance to you know, present some of my work and get into discussions with you. And potentially we can continue some of that um, in, in the future. So let me see, let me um, share my, uh, my screen so that, uh, yeah. So I guess now you should be able uh, to see my slides. So that's the, the title for today. Um, I will to jump ahead and give you the Gliederung, that's German, so that should be the structure, right? It's the roadmap. First thing is a, is a short introduction about, you know, this topic of the talk today, but also generally my research. Then I will talk a bit uh, more in depth about the, the Network Enforcement Act. So a short uh, version is NetzDG, so a particular anti-hate speech law in Germany that I think is very interesting. Uh, also for, you know, an international perspective and a transatlantic perspective on platform regulation. Then in point three, I will give you some insights on the research that I have been doing in the last kind of two, three years on this NetzDG, working with uh, text corpora, analyzing this discourse. I wanna, wanna show you what we have done and zoom particularly in uh, for this overblocking analysis. So what is overblocking and why have people you know, talking about this with regards uh, to NetzDG so, so intensively that is, if you will, that's the, the main part uh, of, or the main yeah, argument, the main questions that I wanna uh, put out here uh, in this conversation. And then the last um, point is uh, research that I have done or that we are doing here at MIT. Uh, so I wanna you know, talk about the, uh, the US side of things. So that's section uh, 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, I guess that will be brief, but I, by, but I wanna say, uh, uh, what we have done here and also talk about access to data resources for text data mining, because that's uh, what we have been uh, been involved with, particularly in the last couple of weeks. So that's the roadmap. Uh, let's jump right into, uh, so platform regulation in Germany and United States is the, is the, uh, is the main topic. Why is it important? I think the, the big question is, so who can and actually who should determine the the structure of the evolving digital public sphere, that is the big uh, question. And it uh, is particularly rele relevant when it comes to this NetzDG law. I will explain it later, but as I see it, uh, or I, I guess you can at least um, take it this way, that NetzDG and the content moderation practices of platforms 
uh, with their community standards or as community guidelines, as they sometimes say, these are competing regulatory systems that shape what we can say on these platforms. And by doing that, they also shape what can be said in the digital public sphere and what the digital public sphere actually consists of. And obviously that is very important and it is so important because the, the public sphere and the digital public sphere lays the foundations of you know, forming political opinions, both you know, in everyday interactions as well as uh, on election day. And it's so crucial obviously for uh, democracy and um, Western liberal democracies in particular. Um, and what you can see here is this cartoon that I sometimes like to show. Uh, so you have the NetSDG on the left side and you know, big platforms on the, on the right and the middle is it's us potentially, right? The users and we are, you know, poked at, <laughs> I guess, at least here. Uh, and it seems that sometimes we get into to the middle, uh, we are sandwiched uh, in this kind of uh, fight for, um, yeah, for, for power over speech. Um, and I, I, I think that in my my research, one of the key uh, one of the key issues is trying to, to find ways in which we can empower us ourselves. I guess you know the users, and in which they can have as much influence as as possible, and can make the shape of this digital public sphere as whatever democratic um, as possible. So that's why what I think you know is important about about my own research. Um, so let's talk about about this Network Enforcement Act, so NetsDG. <clears throat> I, you know, I have a couple of slides with text. I'm sorry about that, but I want to, you know, give you, so I'll, you know, I'll talk and then you can additionally read if you want to. Um, the point is this NetsDG was enacted in July of 2017, and then it came into effect uh, in January 2018, so a little transitional phase. Um, and there was a there was a very controversial discussion about this law, both in the Bundestag, which is the German Parliament, as well as in the media in Germany, uh, but also in the United States, um, uh, at least you know among among scholars um, and internationally. Um, to give you a bit of a historical context, I think it's important to be aware uh, of what happened before this this law was enacted. Obviously, we have the Brexit referendum, two thousand sixteen as well as the UN, uh, US presidential election in 2016. Um, Cambridge Analytica, uh, Analytica became known and people were aware of the fact that uh, at least potentially um, democratic decision-making could be influenced by uh, the, yeah, uh, what, by the using, let's say, of, of uh, online platforms and basically manipulating potentially what what voters may want to do or want to say. So at least that was that was there. People were thinking about this at the time. So it was seen as a danger that this political decision making process could be hijacked by using uh, social media platforms. There are two other particularly German things that were important. On the one hand, there was a big election coming up in 2017, and people were afraid that similar things as happened in 2016 could happen in Germany as well. Um, and there was this shift to the right in Germany uh, after the European refugee crisis. You may remember Angela Merkel opened the borders. People were welcome from Syria, but it's also led to the right wing party, at least. So there's one in Germany called the AFD, AFD, uh, that you know got more votes and became stronger, and people in Germany were very concerned uh, uh, about that. So this is just to to give you uh, this uh, general um, th this general context. I would say there's another thing to be aware of, and that is uh, European lawmakers had been talking to the platforms for a, a couple of years before that. They have said, you know, you, you need to act quicker on terrorism and on hate speech and take this content off. And platforms generally have said, oh yeah, sure, we will do that. And we look into that. And then uh, not much really happened. So that was, that is, I guess, the, the historical background, background, I would say. And what happened then, uh, so the German lawmakers uh, decided to enact this law. What is it actually all about? It says that uh, platforms need to have a system in place that enables users to flag content that they deem to be unlawful. And unlawful in this case means that, is, uh, that is, it is unlawful based on the provisions of the German criminal code, Strafgesetzbuch, that's a German word, and this, that has um, paragraphs as defamation, incitement to hatred, insults, and so, by, and so, and so on. 
So it's about, I think, 22 or 25 paragraphs that you could um, flag content for with regards to the, this German criminal code. Um, platforms would then have to um, remove uh, reported content, so content being re um, reported by users that is, in quotes, uh, manifestly unlawful and do that within 24 hours of receiving uh, notice of it. That is, of course, you know, putting pressure onto these platforms, 24 hours, depending on how you see that, can, be, can go by very quickly. Um, generally, it has been considered to be uh, putting put in lots of pressure on them. But as you see below, in, in more difficult cases, they were also allowed to take, you know, something like seven days to discuss these issues and make a decision, or they could also outsource it to an independent regulatory body. So there were ways of, of getting away from this time pressure. But generally speaking, time pressure, I would, I would say, was, was there, and it's a main element of, of this law. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in addition, uh, the platforms would have to publish reports about the incoming complaints. So how many uh, pieces of content have been flagged according to NetCG? And then what did they do about it? Did they decide, decide uh, to take it down? Did they do that in a given time frame or not? Or did they leave it up on the platform? Um, they would have to you know, publish reports about that every six months. Um, and the last piece uh, is that platforms that are mostly all of them, I think, are from the, US, from the US. They also would have to establish a legal representative in Germany that the government or other institutions could, could reach out to and basically talk to, because that was, that was not given, right? So these platforms were, were uh, uh, having a tremendous impact on the, on the public sphere in Germany, but there was no one that, that actually the government or anybody else could reach out to and say, hey, there's something happening or whatever. Um, uh, because there was no office or whatever that was actually representing that. And that changed by the NSDG law in, in 2018, for sure. Um, the big problem uh, with this law are the fines. So uh, on the one hand, you know, be, they, they being forced to react to content very quickly in 24 hours, but then also the fines. And here's the stuff on the fines. If platforms failed to implement such a functioning system of flagging contents, or if they systematically failed to take down content that is unlawful or was deemed to be unlawful in the given timeframes, or if they would not uh, publish the required reports, then they could get fined and that with penalties up to several million euros, I think 50 million euros. So that was a steep fine. But something that is important here, and I highlighted it in, in the slide, is systematically. Oftentimes in the reporting, uh, um, and also that, that happened in you know, with scholars uh, all over the place, but uh, also from the US, oftentimes it seemed as if they are thinking if, if there's five pieces of content or whatever, then a fine would be uh, leveraged on these platforms. That is not the case. Systematically is important. So the a systematic failure to, um, uh, to, to um, comply uh, with these three points would actually bring about those fines. Um, what is so? What is the relevance of that? What's what's the important thing about uh, about this NetSDG uh, uh, law? I think what is important is it is the first uh, time that a Western liberal democracy, so as Germany, uh, enacted this kind of a law uh, with regards to unlawful speech that actually undermines U.S. Interme intermediary intermediary liability law. Oh, sorry, that was that was just too much, <laughs> but. Um, Basically, uh, that what is given in Section 230 CDA was undermined by this law in the sense that platforms are partially held liable, liable for user-generated speech, uh, of which they're usually protected from by Section 230. Um, so as you saw there, um, they're, not, they're only held, if you will, accountable if they don't you know, do these, these things that I just mentioned. So they don't, if they don't have the system up, if they don't react systematically uh, to things and if they don't report stuff. But it is a first step at undermining uh, Section 230. And that's why it's so important, especially since it happened in a, in a Western liberal democracy. Um, and the other point, and that is more my point, I think NSDG is so important because of the first point, but then also be, because if you look at it and look at it more closely, you see that there are different approaches regard, with regards to platform uh, uh, regulation, but also generally values uh, with regards to free speech, obviously democracy, and then 
the digital public sphere. And I think it's important to, to look at them, to be aware of them and to discuss uh, those issues also uh, with regards to then coming to a, a joint uh, uh, stance, I would say on that, of how to proceed in the future you know, with uh, the US and, and Europe. Um, here, that's a, that's a post from uh, the human, uh, from Human Rights Watch. So in their opinion, this law was very problematic, right? So they here they're saying that's the wrong way uh, to deal with uh, uh, with online abuse and it should be reversed. So criticism uh, was harsh, partic particularly I would say, uh, uh, or among other other places from the U.S. Um, what was this criticism uh, here? I just have a few points. So there's more to that, but I don't want to bore you too much. But important is surely the first point, right? Uh, so Net G may lead to the privatization of juridical decisions, particularly here then regarding free speech. So it's the platforms who decide what you can say or what you cannot say, and not a, a court who is, you know, uh, which is dem dem democratically legitimized. So that's first big point. The second point is overblocking. We're gonna talk more about it, but the idea is that uh, this law would encourage these platforms actually to err on the side of rather taking stuff down instead of, um, uh, of looking closely to it or leaving it up because they're afraid of the fines, right? So that is one major piece of criticism. Uh, generally, of course, you know, danger to the free flow of information and the internet that was mentioned a couple of times. And then also uh, the last point, copycat laws by authoritarian regimes. It actually happened in Russia, you know, drafted a law that was very similar to the NetsDG. And of course they are using it in very different ways than, than Germany does. But the, the, the point is surely valid that, that um, mm, nation states that don't have a democratic tradition uh, like the United States or, or Europe, Western European countries can use you know, this, uh, this boilerplate uh, to, to do uh, things that, uh, that are not very democratic. So I guess that's, that's fair to say. Um, there were a few points uh, um, or arguments in favor of, of NetsDG or yeah, several, I would say. One is a very German take uh, on things. Uh, so it, actually since uh, Second World War and the Holocaust, there's a, the, the German basic law, the Grundgesetz is actually based on the idea that sometimes you have to restrict basic democratic values such as freedom of expression, privacy, also the market in order actually to protect democracy against extremists. So that's a takeaway from, uh, from the Third Reich. And um, in, 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 in Europe in general, so France, I think this, this uh, exists as well. So this belief is fundamental, at least for the German constitution. And so that's what they're saying, uh, you know, it's fine to have such a law because it actually helps then to, to protect democracy. That's the idea behind it. Um, the other thing mentioned often in Germany is that if these platforms operate in Germany, they should actually comply with German law. I guess that's also something that people can understand uh, very, very well. Obviously, there are cultural differences with regards to content. Uh, uh, I mean, the easiest one is uh, Nazi symbolism is not allowed in Germany in any way. It's been taken down uh, very quickly and you get, uh, you get sued uh, if you uh, post any of, of that stuff which is not the case in the United States and some other uh, countries. So that is a cultural decision, I would say, that is uh, very important uh, to, to us, but it's, it's different in other countries. Other thing maybe, I mean, it doesn't always have to be these, these horrible examples, but also uh, let's take nudity. Uh, Facebook took down a lot of pictures of uh, breastfeeding women in Germany or Scandinavia, people just shook their heads. They, they, nudity is not, not a problem there of that sort. So they don't understand actually, but the issue is there. So those are cultural differences that come into play with regards to content re uh, um, regulation. And uh, it's at least something to think about. Should there be, should platforms react to these cultural differences or, or not, or must they even? Uh, and then the last point is that was received very positively was that having this, this legal entity that represents these platforms in Germany or in these, uh, in these nations, that was actually uh, applauded, I think, across the political board. People thought that would be very important. And I think, um, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I think it's an important point, and it's also obvious that the, the, the market power that Europe has, and then also Germany, is a reason why uh, platforms uh, were willing uh, to do that. And there are many other countries in other parts of the world where, where this is not happening just because their, their market doesn't generate so much uh, leverage. Right? Um, okay, so that was my, my, my spiel, if you will, on the general question of this law and, and what's, what's at stake. Now I want to take you uh, a bit closer um, at my, my research and, and tell you what, what I have done to, to analyze this course about it. And what we did is the first thing is we put together a digital text corpora. First thing is the first corpus is based on German IT blogs. So those are bloggers and websites that report about uh, tech related issues oftentimes tech and policy, also sometimes products. We scraped that from the web and made it uh, accessible with the Berlin uh, Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And if you want to look at that link, so there you can, can access uh, um, this data. I want to sh just show you here a bit. So the kind of blocks we have there are, are particular IT law blocks. We have you know, intellectuals, professors, whatever, writing about these kinds of questions. Uh, also blogs that talk about tech products of, of different sorts. And then what I consider to be very interesting is IT news outlets. So some blogs develop actually from these kind of amateur uh, um, individual blogs into more um, professional blogs. So they have real staff, they report actually every day about developments in tech and policy. And um, they are actually the main thing that got me interested in, in, the, in, in blogs or IT blogs in the first place, because they and other bloggers may actually have a real impact on the, the, the discussion that is out there in, in, in the public sphere and also in the more traditional media, because they're experts and they're, uh, they're monitored for, for the, whatever they post. So this is the first corpus. Oh, we, we searched for our search terms. All these terms here in German relate obviously to this NetsDG law. And this was then, so then, so that means we took all blog posts that mentioned one of these search terms regarding NetsDG at least once and put this, this into our, our corpus, our subcorpus. What you can see here is uh, the, the, the percentage that individual blogs uh, then um, the share that they have in the subcorpus. So how many articles that actually they um, have that, that uh, mention um, this particular law. And yeah, you see netspolitik.org, that is one of those IT news outlets that develop from amateur to more professional, and they are very, uh, very involved in this discussion about uh, the law and other ones um, as well, but then also there are smaller ones. So this is basically the setup of uh, bloggers talking about uh, this particular law. What you can see here is how many articles or how many blog posts did these individual blogs contribute uh, per month to the publications about this particular law. Uh, don't want to get too deep into that, but what you can see is by uh, this, the, the publications basically follow uh, the political process. So as you may remember, in June 2017, the law was enacted. This around this is where you have the first peak. And then it came fully into effect in January 2018. So this is when most people blog uh, about this stuff, which is not so surprising. But it's also interesting that you see uh, the discussion, I mean, then drops, but it continues basically for a whole uh, 2019. So it, 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 it still is relevant continuously. Um, second corpus that we put together, and that was a little more difficult, was daily German newspapers. Uh, we were able to... Uh, compile text for, with the, for the same search terms uh, with regards to NetsDG from those nine most important German newspapers. They really cover, I would say, everything that is of importance uh, with regards to nationwide German newspapers. So very excited to have them all together in one place. And uh, what you see here is again the setup. So how many articles did those uh, individual newspapers contribute to our subcorpus? Um, and the second thing here is again, uh, how many articles did these individual uh, papers contribute per, per month? Same thing here is what you see, uh, they follow the, the political uh, decision making process. So June 2017 and January uh, 2018 being the, the two peaks, uh, but the, the, the discussion still kind of continues uh, on uh, afterwards. As here you have the two graphs together, so blog posts and, and uh, newspaper articles basically 
follow the same, uh, the same pattern here. Um, what we did then is, so I was so interested in, in this question about overblocking. So we did, we took these two corpora and we said, okay, now let's look how this discussion um, evolves, how this discourse evolves with regards to this overblocking thesis. There were others, I mentioned the privatization of, of, of um, juridical decisions or other things you could also have, you know, looked at those ones, but, but I was particularly interested in that one. So this is the one that I'm, I'm picking right here. Overblocking again is this idea. So actually this is interesting. So German, Germans think that <laughs> the word is English, right? Or American. It's not, I think here it's over removal or over regulation or just censorship, but you know, Germans think uh, it sounds so nicely uh, uh, English and uh, it, they think it's not a bad creation. Maybe it's gonna find its way back I I into English language at some point. But anyway, uh, overblocking, the idea is that the fines that the NetSDG law imposes or threatens the platforms with in the end leads them to delete more content than necessary to avoid those fines, right? Simple, uh, um, simple idea also makes a lot of sen uh, a sense and that would then of course restrict people's freedom of expression and would be a bad thing. Uh, interesting is that there's a, another thesis out there, it's what I call the anti-overblocking thesis and that is basically the opposite of it. And that says, because it is in the the platform's economic interest to keep users there as long as possible so that they can gather their data so that they can sell advertisement to them and um, for these reasons they would actually not uh, you know just remove stuff you know without you know looking closely at it just arbitrarily they would rather actually try to have a nuanced deletion policy in order not to you know um, um, get their users annoyed and that they're potentially leaving the, con uh, the, the, the platform or not contributing content anymore. And, you know, that obviously being uh, uh, a dis, uh, disfavor to their own uh, business model. So this is the a second thesis. And um, I, I would say it is uh, interesting at least to, to have it in mind. And I'm gonna say this already here, um, since there's no, we don't have enough data to actually know what the platforms are doing because the platforms are not sharing their data. There's no access to objective data about of their about, about their um, uh, about their taking down of content. I think uh, we do not empirically know if the anti-overblocking thesis or the overblocking thesis is uh, is true. We can only have theories about it, but there is no empirical way uh, to decide that, and that's why. I was thinking it's it's interesting to look at them both and see how how intensively they are represented in a discourse uh, or not. And so that's that's what we did. Uh, I won't get too technical, but but what we did we we took these two corpora, uh, we classified for some examples uh, with a MaxQDA analysis. So that's a it's like Atlas uh, IT, so a mixed method uh, working environment. Then we trained a machine learning model uh, for for with these examples. We ran this model over uh, the, the corpora, so the IT blogs and the newspapers joined together. Um, this threw out, you know, hits, uh, you know, passages uh, where the computer thought this is the overblocking thesis or the anti-overblocking thesis. And then I went through that manually and decided, yeah, is that truly uh, one of these theses? And then I categorized, categorized it that way. Or if it's not, then, you know, it was, you know, taken out of the, uh, out of the equation. That's what we did, and uh, what you can see here is a representation of that. In blue, you see the overblocking thesis and uh, the amount of articles that mention this thesis over time. So everything that is blue is the overblocking thesis, and you can see that's uh, all over uh, all over this chart. It's actually yeah, almost completely blue, and the orange is uh, the mentioning of the anti-overblocking thesis. And that only appears very few times. I actually checked the last one uh, there in 2019. It's, it's not really relevant, so you could even kick kick that out. But it, it's somewhat obvious um, that the overblocking thesis is uh, much more uh, prevailing here. Uh, this chart does the same thing, but it's just relative to the amount of articles published, uh, articles and blog posts per month. 
So uh, it's a relative number, but it stays basically the same. So overblocking thesis uh, shows up many, many times and throughout the whole uh, uh, time frame that we're looking at here. So from the first discussions about the NSTG law up until it's been being in place for, I don't know what, two years or something like that. You can, uh, I think, uh, uh, summarize that very easily. The overblocking thesis is presented very, very often, two, 290 or almost 300 times, while the anti-overblocking thesis is only showing up uh, seven times. So that is a tremendous disbalance. Uh, and that is, I would say, interesting, right? Uh, so it's obvious uh, this overblocking thesis dominates the discourse. And I think it's interesting because of what I, what I mentioned before. We, in my opinion, maybe that's up for debate, uh, but we cannot empirically determine which of the, the two is, is, is true. Uh, and just because we don't have access to the platform's data, uh, and that is why actually I would thinking at least I would be thinking as a researcher or as an academic, I would assume that one would uh, at least mention this anti overblocking thesis once in a while to say, well, uh, it could actually also be that the platforms will, dis will do this in a nuanced way because it's in their own interest. So be when, when we started this, I was actually expecting the anti overblocking thesis to be much more present, uh, at least a bit, at least whatever, 20, 30 times or so so only seven uh, that is uh, that is um, that was uh, very that was surprising to me as well the other point that i mentioned down at the the, the bottom is um, it's also interesting because the the sitting german minister of justice and several researchers uh, in germany as well supported that anti-thesis and particularly the the minister of justice obviously has has the platform to um uh, to make his views uh, heard. So it's interesting that that wasn't taken up neither by uh, the IT blogs nor by, uh, uh, by, the, by the newspapers, right? And that's just, I mean, I just think it's interesting, right? So how, how is that? Why, why is that happening? Um, so these, this leads me uh, to, to those questions that I also see in the, in the realm of a critical discourse analysis. So the question is, you know, what's the reason for this, this balance? Where is it coming from? Um, and who are the stakeholders or potentially interest groups that back so this, this one thesis? And why have they been so successful actually in communicating uh, this thesis over the other? Because you can say, I mean, yeah, in almost 90% of all articles about this topic, there was uh, this, this one sentence or two that says, oh, you know, the, there's the danger of, of overblocking happening due to NetSTG. So I just think that's that's uh, interesting. Uh, and also with the last point, so I mentioned the, the Minister of Justice, it also seems not to have pursued the strategy of focusing on this anti-thesis uh, uh, very much. And that's also, I think, a fair question to ask, what did they do? Seems they, they went for a different strategy. Uh, so they, they pushed rather different uh, sorts of information, but is also, I think, interesting Again, also from the academic point, uh, um, if they are really, if it's really at least difficult to decide which of the two is true, then why is um, uh, why is there hardly any mentioning of the antithesis? Um, yeah, so that that is basically my uh, this, the the questions that I I'm working with and I'm working on based on the those results that I just showed I'm, I'm happy to share some some insights on on where i think this is going uh, or or what happens here but uh in the future with with regards to my research but i also wanted to give you an update what happened uh, in the last couple of years because right so the net dg has been in place since 2018 so that's four years and a bit um it's important i guess to say that no fines were ever issued according to the net dg so that just simply never happened uh, that's also important because I, I think it shows that the, the law was rather intended to put pressure onto these platforms, but not really to, to find them and gain any money out of that. Uh, I guess, of course, you couldn't know that in the beginning, but looking back at it now, I think it's, it's, it's fair to assume so. The other thing is, is sure, also, I mean, uh, yeah, the, in, the end of the free internet in Germany did, did really not come about. Uh, I would say it's still possible in Germany to, to freely express uh, your points of view. Also because there have just not been many reports about overblocking or, or stuff being repressed in Germany at, at all. 
right? So I, there are a few instances, right, in, in January of 2018, when takedown decisions were, were uh, whatever, didn't work out so well, I would say. There were little, little scandals at the beginning, but I'm really talking here of three, four, five instances. But apart from that, never anything else came, came up. So I think it's, it's very fair to assume that no major scandals uh, have been there because the, the blogs and also the media that I looked at, they, they would have been really happy to jump on that and make it a big thing. And they'd simply haven't, right? And then you can see that when you read these blog articles, you can see that netspolitik.org was, was sometimes trying to make a story out of this one artist being blocked or whatever, but you just look at it and say, well, that's, that's not really, that's, I mean, it's always unfortunate if any sort of speech gets, uh, gets uh, taken down or repressed for the wrong reasons. But those examples don't make a case, right? So that was, um, I think, interesting, and 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 is important to to mention. Um, there also has been an update to the NetSDG. Maybe I, I don't go into this uh, right now. I can could talk about it later. They, they didn't change too much. They made adjustments, improvements. Uh, I would say, but let's not go into this. But Rather, let's look at the takeaways from, from this whole uh, procedure or from this whole experience, I would say. What, what you can take away, I think, uh, are these things. On, on the first hand, NSG has started a very much needed and necessary debate about the power of platforms and about the impact that they have on the structure of the digital public sphere. I think that is, um, that is definitely the case. Uh, also in, in countries, other than the United States, right? Obviously in Europe, that's, that's a different thing than in, in the United States. So I think um, it, it, it really has helped to think about these issues and to put them onto, uh, onto a plate. You could also say, um, I mean, there are several, I think really positive aspects. I didn't list them here, but what Facebook did and other platforms is they hired people in Germany to go through content uh, based also with German language skills um, in, in being aware of the cultural situation uh, in, in that state or in that nation, also with access to, um, to a better education for their job and psychological resources for dealing with their job as being content moderators. Uh, because surely you know the discussion about you know, outsourcing this, um, this kind of work to you know, third world countries and having those people deal with the psychological stress you know, that comes with looking through all kinds of uh, uh, content that is on platforms. So they are, uh, at least in these um, content moderation places, uh, they have some you know, resources, psychological support, and so on and so forth. I think that is definitely an improvement. And I think also that actually is a, uh, an outcome of, of the NetSDG. Um, and also it's good that these platforms are more present now in Germany, that a discussion also with policymakers is there, is more lively. It seems they're reacting more to what, what people care about. So th those are good outcomes. What I consider to be really interesting from the theoretical perspective are these, these next points, or particularly part, uh, the, the point two. So there's a US tradition in talking about overblocking or, you know, here, Daphne Keller would rather say over removal or Jack Balkin is talking of new speech regulation and the idea that you know third party speech you know platforms are rather willing to just take down speech that is not their own uh, but uh, belongs to to third parties in difference to let's say uh, newspapers um, so this is a strong tradition and a very important original research if you if you take these you know, results that, that I just presented today, the question really is, do they still apply and to what extent do they apply or do they have to be readjusted or, or not? Or is it also a European question? Is it um, so saying that um, NetsDG may not have led to overblocking? If, if one says that and agrees on that, let's just do this for an, for a, for an experiment, thought experiment. If you say that, if you agree on that, then the question is, uh, is the theory that assumed it would lead to overblocking or to over removal, is that still valid or not? That is, I think, one of the most interesting uh, questions. Although, again, and that's what I said uh, in the last point, so is the NSDG experience an exceptional case, also an exceptional European or potentially also German case? That is also a question. So could you say this, this theory still applies in the United States? 
uh, uh, or other countries, but here in this particular case in Germany, in Europe, with this NetSDG law, uh, it just was exceptional and there things are somewhat different. This could also be um, uh, something, or what could also be the case is that actually uh, that kind of uh, uh, theory tradition is still right. We just have noticed yet that actually there was over removal um, uh, due to, I don't think that's very realistic, but it's it, you cannot, um, I, I would say it's too early to, to make uh, an absolutely positive claim on that. So this is also where I'm working, uh, what I'm working on from a more theoretical perspective. I think that is why NetCG is so interesting because, um, yeah, it, this, this question, will it lead to, to over removal is, is just so pressing and so interesting and, um, you know, engaging with this kind of uh, thinking. Um, all right, so this already leads me slowly to uh, to to wrap up um, with this last point, and that is the research that I have done uh, or I am engaged with uh, here at MIT, um, and that is me trying to compare the discourse about an SDG with the discussion about a reform of Section 230, as I already mentioned. Um, the big question to me is, uh, so has the discourse actually changed since the events of the storming of the Capitol in 2021, so last year? So Section 230 uh, you know, has been discussed, uh, I, I would say, as the same with, with the NetCG, mostly uh, among experts, right? It's not, you know, people on the street are not <laughs> usually meeting in the pub and talking NetCG or, or Section 230. Uh, that's that's sure, uh, but um, in my my case is that NetCG became a thing after it it it, uh, it was enacted, and it and it started a, a politically interested discussion also among you know broader swaths of the population. I mean not so broad, but you know a little broader. And what I was wondering is has something similar potentially uh, happened after January sixth of last year, also with regards to Section two hundred and thirty. Also, the question is, is it now different kind of stakeholders, different groups who, who talk about Section 230 or not? Are they bringing up different sort of arguments uh, when, they, when they talk about it? Uh, in the past, there was, um, there was always you know, stuff related to free, free speech in Section 230, obviously, but then there was also copyright concerns, and then there was uh, sex trafficking as a, as a, as a big topic. I, I was wondering, uh, uh, will those events of the past year have shifted the discourse maybe a little closer to what is discussed with regards to NetSDG. So uh, democracy as a whole, uh, extremist behave behavior, um, and I mean, those kinds of topics. That would be, that would be uh, of interest uh, to me also to see then, can you really compare those two um, um, discussions well, or can you not so well? because they're obviously two different kind of laws, right? Section 230 is much broader and much more basic and much more, in a sense, also, you know, important. Uh, NetCG is much more specific um, and, and deals with uh, also just a, a German situation. So uh, the question is, can you compare it well? I think you can, uh, and I'll be working on that, but uh, it's, it's still, I guess, up for debate. So what we're doing here, uh, or what I've been doing in the last couple of months, is trying to set up uh, digital text corpora in order to do actually more or less the same stuff that I told you about uh, with regards to the German context, now just in the US about this uh, other kind of law. So we're putting together data from Twitter and from Reddit, from IT blogs that are based in the United States or international, uh, as well as we're looking at academic journals and US newspapers in order then again to build subcorpora that are just about this discourse on section 230 with some you know, search terms um, and then see, okay, who are the people that get involved uh, with, with these discussions? So who are the stakeholders? What are the arguments that they bring forward? What are the topics and so on and so forth stuff that you can do with text data mining and here, I think that's one of the last slides that I have uh, important maybe for people that are interested in this kind of a digital discourse analysis with text data mining is the point that it was in the past years always very, very difficult to get a, a, a grip on current or contem contemporary newspapers um, to do text data mining on that, right? 
So you could get uh, access through uh, Factiva or uh, Nexus Lexus. Uh, these providers, though, oftentimes, you know, send out you know, PDF files or whatever. So computing this stuff was difficult because then you would have to change the format into something that's, com that's better readable by, by machines and so on. Um, due to you know, copyright restrictions uh, and, and so on and so forth. But now something has happened, something has changed, and that's at least for me the big news. So with Constellate and ProQuest, two actually data providers have decided to bring to, you know, uh, to produce environments that allow you to work on their full text data. So with Constellate, it's, it's JSTOR articles and articles from Portico, with ProQuest, it's newspaper uh, articles and journals and other data um, that you can work on in an online environment. So basically doing cloud computing where you can work on the full text. So you can do your computing on the full text, but you don't download it. So you can do that without infringing copyrights and without these, uh, uh, these newspapers or the New York Times not being afraid that you take the data and then post it somewhere online and then people won't read the newspaper anymore, right? So this is a, this is a, a very important, uh, tremendous step because I can just tell you, uh, doing the analysis in Germany with these nine newspapers, what we had to do is at the German National Library, they set up a, a machine for me, a computer, that was hooked off the, the internet, so it didn't have uh, uh, um, access to the internet. There they put these files for me and I could work on them, but again, separated from, from the internet and only on the premises of the National Library. So it was because of these copyright and license agreement restriction, it was very difficult and very tedious to work with these kinds of materials. And what uh, uh, Constellate and ProQuest are providing to us right now is, is, I mean, for a researcher like me, uh, uh, absolutely fascinating and, and exciting. <laughs> and that's also why I'm so much in touch with, with AJ from the MIT libraries, because I think these uh, opportunities are just, uh, I mean, they're really truly fascinating. Um, and so what we're doing in this little research uh, team, I, I mentioned my, so I have two Europe's that are working with me and Kurt on this. Um, we are doing these trials uh, with Consulate and ProQuest with ProQuest, we have been working already for some time. So they have, as I mentioned, they have the data available online. They have Jupyter Notebooks, which allows you to, to run your Python or R code and do your analyses. And then you can download metadata or, or you know, graphs that, that belong to that. So we, we're doing this right now. And actually today we have gotten access to, to ProQuest, which does the same thing just with all these newspapers. And it's, I mean, I'm just, I'm, stoked, as you would say, in California, uh, uh, stoked about the, the, those, you have everything there. You have uh, Washington Post, Washington Times, New York uh, Times and uh, Post and US Today and the Wall Street Journal and so many different um, resources from different political spectra, I guess, um, uh, that uh, was never possible before. So that is, that gets me very excited um, and I think is, is important. Oh yeah, so I already talked about this. So you, you do the, the calculations on the cloud computing environment, and then you can do topic modeling, named entity recognition, all kinds of other uh, analysis. And that is very um, convenient and very easy. It's also good for working with students. So these, um, these two students I'm doing this with, uh, they, they already know uh, coding, but uh, it's, it's also, also to teach first steps. So I think these environments are great. And I also do believe, and maybe that's my, my last point, that uh, this kind of a setup uh, will boost uh, text data mining research on these contemporary resources like these media, so the newspaper articles. So um, I would, I would if, I, if somebody from MIT asked me uh, if they should continue this trial with, with ProQuest and Consulate, I would say totally, you should absolutely do that. I think that researchers that are interested in this kind of stuff will always want access of this sort. And I think that uh, universities that uh, that have it and can provide it to their researchers will 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 have a head start and will be able to produce interesting uh, research. And um, so I would say, if you can, uh, then you should do it. And um, I will see if my home institution, if if, if the University of Bremen, uh, will be able to to do something uh, like this uh, as well. Okay, I think that's that was that was it from from my side. I. 
I owe it. I went a little over time, but hopefully not not too much. Um, so thank you very much for for you know listening to to my stuff. I'd be very excited if you have any any questions for me. Uh, also reach out uh, if you if you want to uh, with this email address or contact me on Twitter. Wow! Thank you so much, Jens. I'm uh, I'm completely stoked about the work, <laughs> as they say in California, about the work that you're doing. Um, I have a whole set of questions over here, but um, I want to see if I, I don't see anything in the chat right now. Do, um, do we have any questions out there from uh, maybe to start with our graduate students? Yes, Tomas. Thank you, um, and it's great to meet you. And um, this is extremely exciting. And I wish uh, we would have known of each other before because I'm interested in the same topics. And I think it's wonderful that you're looking at platforms in a in a transnational lens. I think that's super super interesting work that I don't see enough of. And um, I I was really interested in in the fact that you were looking at at this case in Germany where people are you know the the idea is that it's a mechanism to implement the law. But my, what I see in the discourse around the U.S. is that the law is not enough, right? The concerns around, for example, vaccine misinformation, there are not things that are per se illegal to, to spread misinformation, right? But the concern is that as if, as if the law was not enough in the case of the U.S., whereas I, I would see in Germany, you're looking at a completely different concept. So I was wondering if you, if you have thoughts about this, of, of if this came up in your research. I, I feel there's a, like two different imaginaries of the law that are involved. Mm. Can, you, can you be a little more, I mean, uh, specific, where do you see the difference between the United States and Germany in, in, in this case? It's very vague, but I would, say that it, I would say that in the US, the concern, for example, by the government is that, for example, vaccine misinformation is being spread in, in social media platforms, right? Mm -hmm. Or that hate speech is spread on social media platforms. Things that are not illegal, right? They are legally permitted by the First Amendment, right? But, um, but the concern would be that these things are antisocial, but not illegal. Whereas in, I would say that the phenomenon you're tackling in the case of Germany is things that are, like, you know, how do we apply the law in this realm? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess say, I mean, you're pointing to a very interesting issue and that is obviously the traditions are so different, right? Because the first amendment is, is such a, I mean, knockout argument right there's there's nothing that you can do uh, uh, about it or or so the, the traditions are so 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 different that um it doesn't make any sense i assume also to go at it for, or potentially from the legal perspective right because it would be very tremendously different to set up something that is uh, that is really similar right and that is already in a, in a so I had this question up there and you giving an answer to that question. You're saying basically it's so different that in Europe, uh, it, it may it may be working in, in different ways, right? So there may not be overblocking in Europe because it's so different. And, and the United, United States, it, uh, it, it may be um, different. But the thing is that one thing that I at least uh, see and where I wonder um, is what happened at least with uh, President, former President uh, Donald Trump is that in the end, uh, he was right, he was deplatformed, right? So his speech rights uh, were tremendously um, uh, restricted. And also it happened by uh, these uh, for profit, you know, firms, basically, and by no means by any sort of, you know, democratic uh, decision involved. And I'm always uh, wondering if that is, um, if that is a better solution. Uh, to this kind of question or not, or again, the 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 answer from a Europe perspective, European perspective is obvious. You know, Europeans would probably say no. no that is not uh, uh, the good way to do it. There should be some democratic involvement, and there should be some some government uh, um, impact on that. But also here, I'm I'm not so sure. And I'm, I mean, how how the U.S. population or whatever thinks about this, or how the legal setup is. I, my assumption is that this may be different in the United States. That maybe there the idea is rather that um, you know for profit profit companies doing doing that is actually what they feel potentially more comfortable with, right? But um, I think this is exactly the point to to think about and to continue conversations and to to think through it. Um, but also in a, in a sense that um, 
I wonder what it means if these systems are so different uh, that, you know, potentially, as I outlined it here, theory that is based on the US media landscape, you know, and platforms may just not apply to Europe in, in, in this way. If that is the case, then I wonder if European nations and researchers should still, you know, uh, uh, take, take this for granted, you know, also the, the theory. And that is something that I, that I just don't, or that I'm, let's say I'm thinking about. I don't know if that's a good answer to what you've been asking, but. Um... No, thank you so much. I wonder if, if uh, one huge difference, and I don't know, maybe it's not, uh, but between the European context or German context and the US context is the kind of symbolic way that um, children are used in the discourse of censorship and censorship around speech and the notion of protecting children. Um, so that, for example, the in communications law here, um, the notion of indecent speech, it, which is a violation of, of FCC policy is not allowed, is to protect children. So you can have indecent speech after during a safe harbor for indecency. That is late at night when it's assumed that children are asleep, that um, sexually or excretorily <laughs> specific speech is legal, right? But it's not legal, you know, at, at 6 p.m. when children are assumed to be part of the audience. So it's like children become a catch-all to enable a certain kind of regulation in the U.S. And I'm wondering if they are used in a similar um, symbolic way elsewhere. And I guess I would also, well, this is a separate issue, but I mean, there are certain kinds of speech that are legally censorable in the U.S that like defamation has certain laws around it, that speech that is censorable in certain contexts or obscenity is, is technically you know, illegal. Um, uh, speech that in inherently does harm, like yelling fire in a crowded movie theater, right? So just wondering what kinds, so it's two part question. One is about the, the children childhood issue and protecting childhood innocence. And the other is about the kinds of speech that have long been protected in the, or um, censorable in the US and whether there's a comparable body of censorable speech uh, in Germany outside of some of the things that you've outlined. Yeah, well, I would say, uh... The discourse um, about the SDG did not touch very much about protection of children in, in, in this regard, uh, as, as you mentioned, and as it's um, prevailing in the United States. It was very much a discussion about um, these kinds of, you know, yeah, speech rights with regards to protecting democracy. There was also, so the, and that is, I mean, the, the government actually, one, one position that they pushed for is saying that um, we do this to protect minorities and minority speech because they are usually the ones whose voices are pushed to the margins if the mainstream, if you will, you know, speaks up and uses hate speech or speech that is at least, you know, um, uh, you know, offensive or whatever, then usually those on the, on the margins are even pushed further out. They don't speak up, they leave for uh, or whatever. And this is why we, we, we want to push this harder in order that these, uh, that these communities have, have more of a opportunity to speak up. And actually in Germany, it is the LGBTQ community and the Jewish community has, has continuously pushed for, for even uh, harsher laws. And also this update that, that about the SDG. So they have been really uh, trying to actually um, make this, this law also lead platforms to report um, unlawful speech to the government in order that then it, it would, would take uh, been taken to court right away. So I guess the, the, it has rather been a discussion about um, I mean, these kinds of minorities and how you can protect them uh, from not being pushed out of the public discourse, I would say. Definitely then, so ch children's uh, issues have been, to my understanding, even uh, they have been hardly been uh, uh, a point in, in this discussion. Um, That's interesting. I mean, it's just a huge difference, I think, from the US context. And also just the kind of status of, of say, what it means to be an extremist in the mm -hmm. US and in, from a legal perspective versus uh, in Germany. You know, we said specifically that an argument in favor of NetzDG is that, you know, you restrict democracy, you protect democracy against extremists. In the US context, I thought, you know, what would be the argument in a, a congressional debate about what an extremist is, and it would be uh, quite different than I, I would think than in the German context. Interesting. 
I mean, that would that would be interesting to to me um, as well. I mean, or to look at, you know, who who is actually considered a, extre an extremist in both countries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, would be interesting. I mean, to your second point, maybe, um, and I and I hope I, I um, got it right. I would just say interesting to me as regards to to the to the law. Uh, that so you have these these paragraphs right uh, according to the German criminal code, um, but I wonder if, I mean, if I were to interpret the move to actually you know enact this kind of law, I would really think and guess that it was not so much about individual cases of these paragraphs, but rather of pushing for the attentiveness of these platforms. To, to cater to whatever, in this case, German German needs, and be be more responsive and be more aware, and uh, and these kinds of, of of things. I mean, I um, so I think what at least in the first kind of couple of reports, these six six month reports, uh, um, incitement to hatred uh, was was often mentioned in defamation and uh, some sort of insults. Um, it turned out that uh, um, the the platforms didn't take too much down in any way, right? So they looked at it, but then oftentimes they made the decision: this is covered by free speech, and we just uh, leave it up up there. Uh, but um, yeah, again, I, I I got the feeling that pushing them for for more action was was really um, intended. Again with this fear that, you know, something could happen in this particular situation of 2017 and being forced to, you know, react. Thank you. Shrushi, I see you have your hand up. Hello, thank you so much for your lovely talk. Uh, my question is uh, to just to, like get your general take on the conversation of decentralization and how that, m that might be a p place of research or or this sort of move of even capital into companies and organizations that are considered decentralized, right? Like there's no one governing body. Is there a potential to challenge some of the perceptions of platforms and between different continents? Like just general thoughts on this is a trend, it's a buzzword right now. It's used everywhere in finance and governance. So so what do you, what do you think of it? Well, you know, I, um... I don't know if I if I have a good grab on that, but I would think that um, you know trying to make money off of the platforms as these social media platforms do, you know, brings a centralization with it, you know, that you know is basically the opposite of decentralizing them and people just you know throwing throwing in in stuff uh, and that actually their their content moderation practices and these guidelines are actually the opposite. They are structures that try to, to uh, keep, you know, bring things back to the center or at least allow them, you know, of, to make those decisions uh, and to structure, if you will, then discourse. Or um, also, I mean, it's important for them true, truly in a sense that they, right, they wanna create these, uh, these um, communities that they, that they want so they can, you, they can stay there. But um, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, indifference to a, a truly open platform that would uh, allow uh, people to uh, to contribute in, in ways that they would want to and that would be truly decentralized. This kind of uh, you know closed, if you will, platform this structure you know that these kind of platforms build up is is opposing, I guess, this ideal. Um, I don't know if that is what you've been asking for, but uh, if you throw that buzzword at me, then that, that would be uh, my, my take on it. You're muted, Heather. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. Um, do we have any questions from our attendees who are outside of our main room? I'm just looking over here to see. All right. Well, I will. I will. Otherwise, I have a few more that I've written down here. Surprise. Um, you you uh, asked specifically. You know, has the discourse changed since January six? And I think that you um, started to answer that. But I wonder if you could answer that more. Um, and it gets back to my question about extremists and so on, um, and um, tendentially or by extension, the issue I was 
about uh, protecting children and so on. And so far, so many of the extremists from January 6th believe that there is a sex trafficking ring led by Democrats and, you know, that the Democrats are the extremists and they're the not extremists and so on. But anyway, could you could you unpack a little bit how the discourse has changed since January 6th from from the U.S. end, at least? Or is, it, or is January 6th, how is it understood in a German perspective, even? Like you, you could respond from both sides? Um, uh, well, that's a couple of interesting things there. So, I mean, I, I would say from, from our analysis, we are just not there to, to make claims about what has changed uh, uh, since January 6th, because we just don't have the data yet mm -hmm. you know, to say anything about it. So I couldn't make a, a, a clear statement on that. My assumption, you know, would be uh, that uh, the discourse has uh, has grown, uh, and in the first case, I mean, that's not so, you know, <laughs> surprising potentially, but that is what I assume. And as I as I already said, uh, I, I assume it um, drifting away from these from these other issues to a more politically focused and, if you will, then extremist uh, a question. But I mean, it really would have to. Um, we would have to to uh, look at it more closely. I'm also wondering: Will more, you know, more mainstream, uh, whatever outlets or or users, whatever, have engaged in that conversation? I assume so. But also, you know, there's no no data there that that we could uh, that could. I mean, I could base my claims on. So I, I, I think we'll. I mean, I would I would rather wait than to make any claims that I cannot back up in in any way. Um, from from the German uh, perspective, I mean, I, I saw, I mean, I didn't do particularly research on it, but I mean, Germans have been so critical of the last administration in so many ways, from the right the beginning, and uh, it is just, I mean, you get a, uh, I mean, I was in uh, in the U.S. by by the by the election uh, 2000. If you're German, you cannot not think of of 19. 33. I mean, it happened to everyone, right? That you were immediately, uh, you were afraid and, and anxious. And of course, that may be not, uh, you cannot compare history uh, that easily, but uh, that has been so prevailing in, in Germany from, from the outset. And um, uh, in, this, in this regard, also, I, I think that Germans uh, have been very uh, relieved, you know, when there was a a takeover and an exchange of, of, of power that was more or less peacefully. Um, um, and they were, I mean, I guess, you know, shocked ab about what, what happened there and how um, how things unfold. I mean, that's very general, but um, this this is how it has been, it has been seen. Um, with regards to the platforms, I think people were, um, were also, uh, um, interested but but also shocked i mean i think the power of these platforms has become ob obvious to really now everyone uh, what they can do and that they can shut down uh, also a political leader and they also I mean, have noticed many times that you know things are so different now since trump is not tweeting <laughs> every day anymore and he's not on the news you know right and it's basically somebody pull the plug and, and things have been completely different. And I think that has been very, very much noticed uh, in, in Germany as well, which again, doesn't necessarily make the thing uh, completely um, makes it easier because it means you have to deal with these entities. And it seems that um, maybe they, maybe people are happy that the European Union is pushing in many directions, you know, with privacy law. So also with this national approach, you have now the Digital Service Act and the Digital uh, Markets Act. Um, that that tries to to deal with these platforms, but on the other hand, what really matters is the United States in in, in some sort of way. And there, I think people see uh, or are assuming that there is hardly a way to really act on these platforms potentially. Well, that's what they've seen. You know, people uh, had to report to Congress or what have been questioned by Congress, uh, but uh, but there's 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 no uh, substantial movement uh, that could solve also easily solve that 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 question so these uh, firms are very very powerful they have a huge tremendous influence and uh one one wonders how how the us will be able to whatever d deal with that also from a political uh, perspective one does wonder thank you uh, tomas has a has some questions for us i believe yeah um i was wondering 
as a more so not, not, not only the specific research product, but more in your in your general research, if you have seen different accounts of the digital public sphere in in the US and in Germany and, and whatever that means, right? Yes. I mean, I would I would say in in so in so many ways, right? I mean, uh, the the media landscape is very different. You know, we we have this public uh, so öffentlich rechtliche Medien, which is public media broadcasting. They are financed by the state. They they inject uh, something of uh, yeah importance uh, in in a sense of a of a certain viewpoint or a variety of viewpoints that I, uh, although I'm not so much of a media user here as I, as I am in Germany, but, but I am as well, which doesn't seem to be, be present in, in this way, right? So that is a, this right there, a tremendous uh, a difference. And, um, you know, that also means, right, it is uh, the market is, is less, I mean, there's a little restriction on the market side because the, the government funds uh, media in, in this sort of way which already changes the whole, whole setup uh, uh, a little more. So, I mean, these are very, very basic uh, dimensions. Um, but also when you look at, at usership, I, I think, you know, um, a lot more people in the United States take their news from social media than in Germany. It's also always rising in Germany continuously year by year, but still there's a tre tremendous difference. Uh, it also uh, showed uh, that in this particular um, election that I mentioned in 2017, actually there were hardly any reports about, um, uh, you know, bot influences or whatever, this kind of Cambridge Analytica stuff that happened in 2016. I don't know if that's the case because uh, people were more aware of that and aware we're technically already fighting these things better, or also because the media system in Germany is simply different. People relying more, still more on traditional media, newspapers, uh, this kind of public broadcasting uh, um, and media, um, but I think you know it's uh, it's fair to say that the impact um, uh, wasn't as uh, as intense as in the United States and and Great Great Britain Great Britain in in two thousand and sixteen. So I mean those are just a couple of um, uh, of things that that come to mind uh, thinking of the uh, of the public sphere, but I'm I'm pretty sure there. There are many others uh, uh, that, that come uh, come to mind. But may I ask you? I mean, you, you maybe you're not uh, um, born in the United States. Uh, how is it in, in your country? Do you, do you recognize a, a clear difference? Well, I mean, yes, I'm from Argentina. Um, I I mean, the public sphere is obviously different. Um, I mean, very very radically different. But uh, I'm thinking that like, what is it like? My question, and I think you answered it partially, was um, understanding specifically of how they see the digital public sphere, right? How do they see the, the realm of conversation on the digital sphere and on digital media, I mean? And it's something interesting that happened very recently. It's that the government uh, made an announcement that they were trying to start some conversations around what um, good practices for social media companies so they stop uh, intoxicating our democracy, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of, of, of Biden's comment about uh, when he was asked uh, what did he think about Facebook uh, and probably related to vaccine misinformation. He said that uh, social media companies need to stop um, destroying our democracy or something very similar, I think. So I, I've been thinking a lot about how um, they understand different countries, what it means to be in a, in a healthier democratic debate in a you know, liberal public sphere on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I may just say two things. I mean, what, what brought me also to this topic is, is um, the idea, I mean, there was a great idea. So the internet would bring more freedom to all of us and more democratic discourse and so on and so forth. And, and then we are all aware that maybe that's not really going to happen so much. Also because they are centralized, again, these platforms and they have an agendas. And they're also, as you mentioned, potentially you know, spreading fake news or polarization or polarizing content is you know, useful to them and will bring more money in um, all of these things. But I also thought one of the issues why I'm looking at this is that <clears throat> is actually technical experts who have access to this and not so much former polit or politicians, the traditional politicians. Uh, and it's so difficult for, I think, the 
you know, whatever everyday Joe on the street to understand what's going to ha what's, what's happening here on from a legal perspective, but then also from a uh, from a t technical perspective, right? For a lot of you know for for uh, some time, people didn't realize that their their feeds, right? They are constructed in some sort of way, and that is based on some sort of data, and that you can be manipulated by the the pieces of information that is set in front of you right i mean now people know especially of course when you are in, in media studies but um for you know years ago people weren't necessarily aware of that so i'm i'm so this research project is also about seeing how can you translate these technically uh and legally complex issues for a discussion in broader society so that people can make informed decisions about their future and the way politics should be done. And NetSDG discourse and potentially other ones as well are just examples where I, I wonder if that actually really works or works well. Yeah? And uh, what I presented here with the, the overblocking and anti-overblocking thesis uh, is just one example. I would say simply if, if this was a perfect and ideal discourse, you would mention these two options, right? It could be this way, it could be that way. And, and then people would, uh, you know, look at researchers, what they, have, they said about it, and then you would make an informed decision. This is not happening for different reasons, right? I haven't uh, gone uh, into explaining that too, too far, but that's interesting for me to look at, and, and I have at least a few ideas. Some, something that I at least still wanted to mention, uh, because I'm always uh, such a European year, and I am, and that's, uh, of course, uh, you cannot drop that. But um, I just wanted to mention that one surely has to keep in mind that uh, Europeans or the European Union uh, also has an interest in diminishing the power of these platforms because they've never been able to come up with something on their own, right? There's no European platform that provides, I mean, except for a few, I mean, there's a there's a Scandinavian thing, uh, Klarna or so, they, they do finances and then there's another one here, but basically there are no big powerful platforms that provide people with those essential, you know, social media um, uh, features that whatever Facebook, Twitter, and so on do, right? And so there isn't a, I think it's, yeah, it's obvious that there's some political economic incentive, right, to push for more privacy legislation, to push for something like NetsDG, also to say, okay, we want to we want to have a say again, we want to get a grip on the public sphere, but also we want to, uh, you know, rein in potentially these platforms. That is, I think both, it is driven by, uh, by truly important and democratic values, but it is also, there's also an economic uh, competition going on there. And I would be, I think it would be naive not to, not to see this point, right? So um, I just wanted to mention that. So that is also part uh, of the picture uh, that, uh, that, you know, has a, uh, has a component in the European approach to this. So. Uh. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jens. Um, I think that uh, we're going to end here, but I'm going to make a few plugs and announcements before we go, not just for our grad students, but for other for our guests. Um, one is that a week from today, we're going to have uh, a Finnish speaker, Oscar Vinberg, who recently defended his dissertation on the 70s TV show All in the Family. And he's really speaking from a um, uh, kind of political historian's angle in a way more than a TV studies angle and looking at the uses of this TV show to promote legislation, for fundraising, for political candidates promoting agendas and so on. And it's just it's really interesting and, and quite unique work. Um, the day after that, uh, a week from tomorrow, um, and I'm just going to pop this up into the chat area, a link here, we have thesis day when our grad students present uh, their work. Uh, formally their, their master's thesis to the community. And MIT people can come in person. It's in Bartos uh, Theater. And um, uh, other people can come in person too if they get TIM tickets, which we can tell you about. You can email me or, or Andrew Whitaker. Uh, so it is, it is open to the public. Uh, there's a reception afterwards and it's also streamed if people want to access that from a distance. So I want to encourage everyone to, to attend that. It's really like our showcase for how wonderful our graduate students are. Um, and finally, I'll just note, uh, I think in many ways relevant to what we've been talking about today on April 14, uh, Martha Minow of um, 
uh, the Harvard uh, Law School, um, will be speaking with me in conversation about her uh, recent book, Saving the News, which is you know thinking through regulatory issues um, and how uh, it, it's a very dramatic title, right? As she's thinking specifically about um, the the death of, of print media and the ways that uh, uh, or print news media and the ways that regulations have sort of not kept up with technological changes. And I'm certain that I haven't finished reading the book yet, but I'm certain the section 230 is going to be a really um, important issue that we're going to be talking about. So in many ways, uh, quite different methods from, uh, you know, legal scholar from what we've been talking about today, but I think it's going to be quite relevant to some of the issues we've been talking about today. So um, with those plugs uh, for the future, I will end here and I will thank you again, Jens, and give you a round of applause uh, for presenting your work. It's really great to meet you while you were uh, visiting here with us. And uh, thank you so much for sharing what you're doing. So perfect. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.